They can decide whatever it is they want to do. We don't allow guns in the house of God. Okay, now I've got to decide if that's a deal breaker for me, if I'm going to go somewhere else, or if I'm going to ignore them. And I know in some people's theology, go, oh my gosh, if you ignore the pastor, you're in sin. Ah, pastor ain't Jesus. LuckyGunner.com is my go-to resource for in-stock, fast-shipping ammunition. Whether you're looking for rifle ammo, handgun ammo, rimfire ammo, or shotgun ammo, go to LuckyGunner.com for the best place on the internet to find it all in stock and ready to ship. They have stood by us all in this ammo pandemic, given us great education via their YouTube channel and their ballistic testing as well. Go and check them out and find great ammo ready to ship at good prices. Now, I get it, okay, in Catholic theology, the priest is somewhat the vicar of Christ, and I don't want to get involved on that side, okay? And I understand that. Yeah, so, so listen, I'm, okay, Protestant, you know? <laughs> I've worn a clerical collar one time in my life, and that was to fool the federales at the border of San Ysidro. Worked like a charm. <laughs> they did not want us to cross the border with a whole bunch of stuff, and they, they were like, we want a whole bunch of taxes and all that stuff. Went back across the border to the family Christian store, bam, popped that collar on. Hola, señor. ¿Cómo está usted? Oh, padre. ¿Cómo está? Está muy bien. Gracias, padre. Ooh, we roll. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, yeah. So, church size, very good. And formal versus informal. Generally, the larger the church, the more formal you got to be. We've talked about that. Some church uh, insurance companies... Are, they struggle with formal teams. So if you're going to formalize your team, check with your insurance company. Now, Brotherhood Mutual insures about 70% of churches in America. You should absolutely have your church insurance checked by your agent. And if you haven't had an insurance uh, you know, analysis and assessment by your agent in a while, you should. Uh, and, and if you go to your leadership team, deacons, elders, however that works for you, board, and you go, hey, when's the last time we did an insurance audit? And they go, what? Guess what you just found? An opportunity for improvement. And they go, no, we're going to do that. Because your insurance agent will sit down. That's what this part of the policy means. It costs this much a year. That's what this part of the policy means. And Brotherhood Mutual now allows for non-sworn on armed security teams. They do allow for that now. That's changed over the last several years. Uh, seven or eight years ago, uh-uh. They wouldn't have it. And so you couldn't have a formal team if you were Brotherhood Mutual insured. Now they will. They'll write you a writer for it. It's a couple hundred bucks a year. It's really not a big deal. Um, and, but they want to have some policies in place and they want to see that you're doing good risk mitigation is what they want to see. So make sure that you are. Uh, and, and, and that goes for a lot of areas of life in terms of insurance company. Um, I think Brotherhood Mutual's uh, system of called reducing the risk for uh, minimizing the risk of, of uh, sexual abuse of the children in your children's ministry is a really great program. It's not super invasive but it does require a little bit of work on your part in helping make sure that your kids are safe. And if your church agrees to abide by it, they give you a discount on your insurance rate. So cool. If we do things that are smart, guess what? That decreases our liability risk, and the insurance company likes that, and we're doing the right thing anyways. <laughs> this is a good thing, right? So uh, both require training. Now, when you are uh, operating, if you have a formal team, and you, by formal, I mean organized. The members are known and listed. You have you know, admission to that team. So you know, you've got interviewing processes, stuff like that, formal procedures, uh, roles that are formally recognized. Then when you are on the team, you are acting as an agent of the church from a legal perspective. Paid or unpaid, you're going to be acting as an agent of the church, which is why a lot of churches don't like doing that, of course. Uh, otherwise, you on your own, fam. And, of course, the insurance companies, their whole goal is to eschew as much liability as they possibly can because that's how they make money. And that's not that being evil. That's not evil insurance agents. That's, no, we, we you know, if it's not a part of what we have to cover, then we're not going to. Um, so I, I think having personal coverage is, of course, a no-brainer, $20 a month, and I don't have to worry about the financial side. If, God forbid, I'm in a defensive gunfight, <laughs> take my money. Uh, and as a church, same thing, having that extra availability of the legal side. And, and, and more than even just the, uh, the legal representation, the reason that I love FLP is, um, is that there's some counseling services involved. There is bail money, replacing the gun that I'm never seeing again. Some people freak out about that. I don't. If I have to use my gun to defend my life or my congregation, it's gone. I'll never see it again. I'll get another one. 
I have one just like it sitting in the safe. It will come out and, and, and start doing duty. Now, if, God, if I ever do get it back, cool. That's a bonus. Look, I got a free gun. Right? And uh, I once had a guy, he was on the channel out of Bountiful, Utah, and he was at a pawn shop, and uh, two guys on a multi-state armed robbery streak robbed him, and uh, he shot and killed one of them. <coughs> And had to wrestle with the guy, shot him in the neck, he shot him in the guts, in the hand, in the neck. And, and then had to fight the guy for that guy's gun for about 10 seconds while he bled to death all over him. So the guy tackled him and he just, ble just literally covered him in blood. It looked like a horror movie. So he took his gun, they put it into evidence. And six months later, after they decide, of course, this is justified conduct. It was all caught on video. It's just fine. So then they release his gun back to him and he's like, it's covered in blood. Now, of course, caked on blood that has completely ruined the finish of that gun. And he's like, John, I don't know what to do with this gun. And I was like, well, I mean, on the one hand, you are 1-0 and in gunfights with that gun. <laughs> so if you want to send it off to get reblued and keep carrying that gun, then that's fine. On the other hand, it's, it's a marker of the worst day of your life. And so if you just want to get rid of it, that's fine. I was like, me? I would leave it just like it is and put it in a shadow box. That, that'd be me. i put it in a shadow box and, and just put 1-0 and o on it and put it up in the pawn shop and the, and the gun will be like what's that oh that's that's the gun I had to use to defend my life that day and I'm 1-0 with it you know and I hope to God I never have to put another one up you know Carol do you have a, a, a statement or question too well in addition to my question what did he do what did who did <laughs> oh he ended up getting rid of it he ended up he ended up actually having it destroyed yeah. uh, my question had to do Well, so what they require, okay, let's, let's, when boink. I was, when I was teaching in school, we had to do all that blood-borne pathogens, sexual abuse, all that kind of stuff. Sure, yearly. yeah. Usually what they require, so, so um, Brotherhood Mutual is reducing the risk is the second point here. I think it's a great program. What it basically requires is it requires you to, anybody who's working with your kids to have attended your church for a certain length of time, for a, a non-trivial time. So they suggest six months. Uh, they don't give you a hard and fast on that. They do require everyone that works with children to be background checked every three years and to go through annual sexual abuse prevention training. Now, how would we do that as a small congregation of 100 to 150? I feed them. I would say, hey, everybody, anybody that's working with the kids, we're doing reducing the risk training after church. Pizza is provided. We're going to sit and watch the DVD. We're going to talk about it. We're going to update you with the policies and procedures. We're going to talk about any challenges that we have. Make sure that we do that. Then they also require uh, what they call a two-worker rule. So that means two uh, trained and qualified workers with any group of children at any church event at all times, and those two workers cannot be uh, legally obligated to love each other. Now, you should have more. Most settings, you probably need more than two, but a minimum of two. And husband and wife, again, don't count because a husband and wife don't provide balance of power. Uh, I know plenty of spouses that will cover for each other's sins uh, and their shortcomings in, in grave amounts both ways. And so uh, is, it, is it impossible to think of a, a husband who is a sexual abuser and a wife who knows it but won't turn him in? It's very common. So we just don't, nope. Now, I'm not saying that I know people that they go, but, but, but we want to work together in children's ministry. Cool, we probably need a third in that class then. If we have a third, now we have a balance of power. Now, now we're safe and good. And that's okay, okay? So it is absolutely imperative that our children are kept safe from sexual abuse in the church, as well as physical, emotional, or spiritual abuse. Those things are all real. So knowing how to see the signs of physical abuse, knowing the signs of emotional abuse, Understanding spiritual abuse. Almost all church settings, any of the other abuses include spiritual abuse because they almost always come with authority, right? So anybody that's got that kind of spiritual authority, that could be anything from a Sunday school teacher to a deacon to the pastor. Any abuse they perpetrate on somebody is commingled with spiritual abuse. And of course, do we have to protect our children from that? Unequivocally, yes. Absolutely unequivocally, yes. I, I think, remember what Jesus says, let the little children come to me. He has special interest in the care of children. And, and special condemnation for those who abuse children. And we should absolutely stand between abusers and children. Of course, the problem with that is, is that people who are uh, showing cluster B personality disorder and dis disordered behavior, they're absolute masters of gray man. And they will sneak in and build trust. 
So if you don't have structures in place to keep them from uh, perpetuating abuse on people and see the red flags and live them out, you will struggle with this. And that's just the bottom line, okay? Really like Brotherhood Mutual's reducing the risk. I can't tell you this third one enough. Trust but verify. Verify, verify, verify. And never let a red flag go. If somebody comes and they want to work with children and they squick you out, that is your creep alarm. That is your subconscious telling you something ain't right. Stick that calibrated thumb out there. And you go, mm, that shit don't look right. Guess what? It ain't right. It ain't right. And you got to do something about that. And it's okay to say no. No. Now, I do think that there are times at risk, okay, two worker rule, absolutely, absolutely followed at all times. I can't tell you the number of times when we were visiting churches when I first moved into the Phoenix Valley, you show up and there's like a 14 year old teenager, a teenage girl who's just watching kids in a room all by herself. You want to talk about just an absolute disaster waiting to happen. Not only, not only legally, but spiritually and morally. And we're accountable to that. You cannot have that in any capacity. You must keep your children safe from that. So having a robust children's safety program and verifying at all times. I'm telling you, one of the things that I would do every Sunday school, I was teaching a Sunday school class, and then as we got started, 10 minutes before Sunday school, I'd start checking in on our kids' rooms. Do I have our two workers? You guys okay? You got everything you need? Cool. You guys need any help from me or anything like that? Great. Come over to this one. Oh, hey, where's your second? I don't know. Who's your second today? My second is so-and-so. I'll be right back. I'm going to go find that person. Hey, did you know that you needed in here? Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, I forgot. Great. Thank you. We need to have our second in that classroom. And that's, that's a marker of protecting your kids. And you've got to be strong enough as a safety team that if you don't have that, you start combining classes and shutting things down. Hey, we can't do it. We don't have enough safety margins. Got to have those safety margins. And, and that might mean you're the heavy. And they're like, what do you mean, man? We gotta, we've always done it this way. We've always taken this giant, crazy-ass risk and I want to keep taking this giant crazy ass risk. No, let's, let's mitigate that risk. It's quite a big deal, okay? That two worker rule has to be followed. That's, so here's the thing, most sex abusers, most childhood sex abusers have no criminal background. Their stock in trade is hiding, okay? And, and shame and silencing and separating, all right? So the background check only weeds out obvious offenders. Okay? Most of whom are court mandated not to be there anyway. And when that, when that hits hard, you know, when, when that, that um, background check shows up and shows the child sexual, sex abuse in the background, uh, your next call is to the local PD. Hey, I'm pretty sure this guy's on an offenders list and is just trying to work with my kids. We will go pick him up. I have evidence why he turned in an application to work with my children. <laughs> And now he's going to head back to prison where he belongs. But those are very, very rare. Uh, what does prevent it is the balance of power, and you never allow adults alone with, uh, with children. Never. And, and you know where that gets you sometimes? Youth group and, oh, we'll drop everyone off at home. Terrible idea. Nope, come pick your kids up. Or at least, if you're going to do that, two worker rule in the vehicle at all times. Youth pastors are, are terrible at this. And the number of youth pastors abusing the, the children in their, uh, in, in their ministry, astronomical. Astronomical. And I'm not, I, I, I hope that you're like, gosh, is John just trying to scare me? Absolutely I am. I'm absolutely trying to scare you because the risk is absolutely real. Youth pastors are the worst at this. Just, just Google youth pastor sexual abuse. You will see 30 stories in the news across the nation right now. Now you're like, well, but there's a million churches, John, so you know, there's, there's 800,000 churches in America and I get 30 instances of abuse. That's true, and you can take steps, though, to make that sure that you're not one of them. I can't protect the world, but I can protect my kids. And, and if you want to see a church shut down, allow that to happen in your midst. It'll, it'll just nuke your church. It'll absolutely nuke your church. If this is a church, this is a people problem, right, that we have to get better at, at, at not hiding from. And I think 
full transparency here in front of the church. This is what we're doing to prevent child sexual abuse in our midst. We never want a child to get abused in our midst. We will not tolerate that. Here's what we're going to do for that. Um, is I think just being full transparency with that. And always, I think, from the, from the pulpit, encouraging our pastor to go, listen, if ever you've, you have had anything happen to you in any environment, not just here at church, but at school, at home, any of that stuff, any kind of abuse, we want you to come forward with it and be honest about it so that we can stop it. And we are on your side, and we will not perpetuate abuse, and we will not tolerate abuse. For a long time, the church has, has stood on the abuser's side, and, and that has to change. It has to stop. Okay? Has to.